Good evening. Is that working? Can everyone hear? Um, no? No, I'm sorry. I, I just knew that they weren't using that. But you've got to keep that recording. We're good? All right. It's good to see you tonight. Let me begin with a quote. Unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he will not even become its slave, but rather its champion. No speech, I believe, is ever quite complete without at least a couple of quotes from the British writer G.K. Chesterton. And here's another. Fallacies don't cease to be fallacies because they become fashions, end quote. Fashionable fallacies thrive all around us. In fact, I don't believe there's ever been a time where doing the wrong thing has ever been more hip and more cool. But yet, the fashionable fallacy that a woman's right to choose supersedes all other considerations is actually losing some ground. Over the last few years, the media has grudgingly been reporting that majorities believe that abortion is morally wrong and that legal access to abortion should be restricted. Right here in Madrid, over one million protesters joined together in a 2009 march to demonstrate against the government's plan to legalize abortion and to remove parental consent requirements. As the ranks of the pro-life movement swell with young people, a phenomenon that's actually being observed worldwide, it's a time to celebrate, it's a time to engage, it's a time to plan and to continue in this great cause of life. The future of the pro-life movement indeed does appear hopeful. But as to the question before this panel today, will the next generation be pro-family? Unfortunately, I have to respond, mm, maybe not so much. And if my analysis is correct, what does it mean to the future of the pro-life movement? And more importantly, what does it mean to the unborn as we go forward? Perhaps the best place to start is with a question. What does it even mean to be pro-family? What would a person who identifies as being pro-family believe and how would they act? And to that question, I offer this definition, pro-family to be pro or supportive of a natural or nuclear family, including efforts to address all the issues that sustain it or promote the family and to stand against efforts to destroy or diminish it. What are some of the characteristics of someone that might be pro-family? Of course, they would oppose abortion and so, oppose abortion and encourage adoption. They would oppose euthanasia. They would promote and they would participate in marriage. They would oppose premarital sex and cohabitation or living together prior to marriage. They would promote abstinence before marriage and fidelity in marriage. They would believe in lifelong marriage and discourage low conflict divorce. They would probably oppose same sex marriage and the mainstreaming of homosexual behaviors. And they would support parental rights and parental involvement. Now you can decide where you fit in that list and in that continuum and spectrum, but there is no question that we are going through a time of great social upheaval regarding our domestic lives. And marriage historian Stephanie Kuntz puts it this way, quote, today we are experiencing a historical revolution every bit as wrenching, far-reaching, and irreversible as the Industrial Revolution." End quote. Premarital sex has rapidly become the norm. Cohabitation, living together, those rates are soaring. Those that do get married are marrying later, and they're having fewer children, and those marriages aren't lasting. And yet the research is clear. Failure to form marriage and the breakdown of a family as a whole puts our children at greater risk of every adverse outcome that one could possibly name. But have we considered what the impact of family breakdown is upon our unborn children? Have we thoroughly considered what the social consequences of premarital sex have upon our unborn children? About a year ago, I 
saw this chart I'm about to show you on a website called Live Action. And when I saw it, I thought, wow, that cannot be right. I grabbed my calculator, found this study, and sure enough, the man who put this chart together had it right. And as you can see, it is abortion by relationship status. And if you look across the bottom, at the very bottom, it shows you those who are currently married. Okay, first of all, this is the rate of abortion per 1,000 women of childbearing age, age 15 to 44. The relationship that has the lowest abortion rate, not surprisingly, is those who are currently married, going from the bottom up. The next lowest is never married, not cohabiting, then formally married, not cohabiting. The highest rate of abortion is co in cohabiting relationships. This, this particular chart gives a snapshot of what I believe might be a key to predicting the future of the pro-life movement. And it says a lot about cohabitation and none of it's good. If you were to take that study and look more closely, you would find that if you enter into a cohabiting relationship relative to being married, you are 4.4 times more likely to have an unintended <coughs> pregnancy. And if you cohabit or live together relative to being married, you are 7.7 .7 times, almost eight times, ladies, more likely to abort your, un your unborn child. Eight times. There are many people that claim there is no difference between cohabiting relationships and marriage. They say marriage doesn't matter. It's, it, it's the same as cohabiting and marriage are the same, they insist. Well, it definitely matters to an unborn child. And if you, we, we know, we've known for a long time that the lowest abortion rate it takes place in married relationships. Ships. So, a simple deduction would be, if you want to stop or dramatically lower the, the rate of abortion, or slow it down, encourage individuals to marry and to say, stay married. Very simple. But if marriage is so important, how does it line up against what is actually occurring today in society? This is the cohabitation in the United States outside of marriage from 1970 to the year 2010. As you can see, a dramatic escalation in the rates of cohabitation. In fact, in the year 2010 alone, there was a 13% increase in cohabitation rates. One year, 13%. And you, we also know that... Let me get my numbers. If you cohabit, well, 60% of all people, currently they, they um, indicate that 60% of all people will cohabit before they get married. Of that 60% that cohabit, only 30% of that group will ever go on to be married. And of that group, those who do marry are subject to an 80% increase in their divorce rate compared to those who have never cohabited. Rapidly rising cohabitation rates are a global trend, as are the skyrocketing rates of premarital sex that accompany it. The liberal media was positively gleeful recently when they were able to report that 80% of all individuals that, they, that the survey was done on and the work was done on, 80% of individuals who identify as being religious also report that they engage in premarital sex. So let me say that again. 80% of individuals who identify as being religious also acknowledge that they participate in premarital sex. And I suspect that a large percentage of that 80% might also identify as being pro-family. I think we have a problem. There, there is a huge disconnect, and that disconnect is having a dramatic effect on our unborn children. Um, take a look at this. This is, across the horizontal axis, you can see this is the number of non-marital sexual partners that you would have in a lifetime. And you've got your vertical axis there that is the percentage of people who will, have, will go on to have an abortion. As you can see, people who never have premarital sex still are having abortions. But you can see the escalation of abortion as it, mirrored, as it goes along with numbers of sex partners outside of marriage. We know that being married and staying married can dramatically lower abortion rates. Then the next question you need to ask is, what impact does premarital sex have on marriage itself? So once again, across the bottom, you see the number of non-marital sexual partners. And up your vertical axis there, you see the percentage 
uh, married individuals that will still be in, sta in stable marriages at the, at the five plus year mark. So if you never have a sexual relationship outside marriage, 80% of those people will still be married at the five year mark. But when you, just one partner outside of marriage reduces the number of people that have successful marriages at the five year mark down to 54. And then you look at this too, just two sexual partners outside of marriage reduces your chance of, of having a stable marriage at the five year mark by almost half. You've almost cut it in half. And relative to married women, women who are single or divorced do have a higher abortion rate. That leads to yet another question. What impact will this type of family breakdown have on future generations and their behavior? There you have teen sexual activity by family structure. Ever had sex? Sex in the past 12 months, sex in the past three months. But this is what I want you to look at. Intact families in every category have the lowest rate of teen sexual behavior. And step-parent families, divorced families, single parent, pretty clear. The family structure matters in terms of premarital sex and it's going to matter in terms of abortion. And one thing that's interesting, the reason people usually give for today's higher rates of premarital sex is that young people are getting married at later ages and it's just too difficult to expect them to abstain from sexual behavior outside of marriage for that many years prior to marriage. So the assumption being that there is no historical equivalent of a period when on average individuals married in their mid to late 20s. Is that assumption correct? Median age of first marriage from 1890 to the year 2010. You can see for men, median age of marriage is just not Take out the last recession where men started marrying later. We had to go clear to about year 2000, 1995 to 2000 before we ever reached the same median age of marriage that we had at the turn of the century. This is post-World War II and you can see median age of marriage drop dramatically. But we know starting in the 1970s, this is feminism pretty much, I would say the sexual revolution. And we also know that we had quite high rates of premarital sex during that time. The point being, well, here, lest you think this is just an American U.S. phenomenon, here's Britain, almost exactly the same. You can see even a higher median age of marriage in the 1890s <coughs> drops during World War II, but we know we had absolute escalating le um, levels of premarital sex. Again, the point is, we don't have any excuse. We can't lay it at the feet of late age of marriage. That, that isn't going to work. What this is, is about, it's not, it's not, folks, you gotta get married so you don't have premarital sex and so you don't have abortion. What we need to do is to be able to develop the narrative so that we can help people to understand that marriage is important for them as individuals and it's important for their future and their children's future. And if we can do that, we're going to be able to help more people have six, get married and have successful marriage and protect our children. The time is short and I've just been able to show you just a glimpse of the research that shows the destructive loop that we're actually caught in. And we have been seduced by the fashionable fallacy that, that any kind of consensual sexual behavior is a private act and it has no consequences. And that simply is not true. As I was explaining to a colleague the gist of my remarks here today, she said, so you mean that we as a pro-family movement are talking the talk, but we're not walking the walk? And I had no choice but to respond. It really seems that that might be the case. Because no matter how much we talk about it, unless we are living lives that reflect chastity before marriage and fidelity in long-lasting marriage, and then are able to encourage and convince those around us to do the same, the future of our unborn children remains clouded and quite insecure. The continued life of the culture of life remains in question. Without a genuine and com complete commitment to live a life that truly reflects a pro-family ethic, 
we are not going to be able to affect the social change necessary to build strong families and strong communities and strong nations, nations that can welcome all children, especially the unborn. I began with two quotes from G.K. Chesterton, and let me close with two. The most extraordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man and an ordinary woman and their ordinary children. And lastly, the true soldier doesn't fight because he hates what's in front of him. He fights because he loves what's behind him. And it is the love of my family that first, my children and my grandchildren, that's what first compelled me to get, engage in this battle. It's the unknown smiles of the thousands of yet to be born children that keep me in it. May we be true to the deepest understandings and commitments of the pro-family ethic as we go forward together. Thank you.